We are in the book of Mark and we're going to finish the sixth chapter. So we'll look at verses 45 through 56. You remember from our previous passage last week, the Lord did an amazing miracle. He fed 5,000, probably more like 10, 15, maybe 20,000 when you count women and children as well. And so we now read in verse 45, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side to Bethsaida while he himself was sending the crowd away. After bidding them farewell, he left for the mountain to pray. When it was evening, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Seeing them straining at the oars, for the wind was against them, at about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea, and he intended to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed that it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke with them and said to them, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he got into the boat with them, and the wind stopped, and they were utterly astonished, for they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves but their heart was hardened. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored to the shore. When they got out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him and ran about that whole country and began to carry here and there on their pallets those who were sick to the place where they heard he was. Wherever he entered, Villages or cities or countryside, they were laying the sick in the marketplaces and imploring him that they might just touch the fringe of his cloak. And as many as touched it were being cured. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's pray. Hymn writers don't always get it right. Dr. Johnson used to quote Lewis Berry Chafer, the founder of Dallas Theological Seminary, who said, hymn writers shall be saved yet so as by fire. That was uh, tongue in cheek, of course, because hymn writers often get it right and put truth in a way that we can express it in worship and get from it great encouragement. For example, one of the great hymns of the faith is how firm a foundation with the line, when through the deep waters I call thee to go, the rivers of sorrow shall not overflow. For I will be with thee thy trials to bless and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. Then when through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply the flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. We want to be gold and we want to be sanctified, but we don't want the deep waters or fiery trials. But the Lord does call us through them. It's by His design and it's for our good. That's a hard lesson to learn. And the Lord's disciples learned it in a night of desperation and terror when they went out on the sea alone. Now, they'd been prepared for it. They had just witnessed a miracle that was so impressive that it's recorded in all four Gospels, the feeding of the 5,000 or 10,000 or 20,000, however we calculate it. But He is sufficient for every circumstance of life. That miracle certainly demonstrated that. Mark wrote, they all ate and were satisfied. John tells us something more though. They were so satisfied that they wanted to make Jesus king. Their enthusiasm came from their stomachs, not their heads. They wanted a king who would feed them, not a king who would save them. 
It was really a dangerous situation. It might scare the Romans or it might provoke Herod, whom we just read earlier in the chapter, was afraid of Jesus and therefore caused a crisis that, at least humanly speaking, might cut short his ministry. So Jesus acted quickly to defuse the situation. He put the disciples on a boat and sent them back to the other side of the sea while he stayed behind to dismiss the crowd. Then with them rowing west, Mark writes that he left for the mountain to pray. Both Matthew and Mark say it was evening. The journey home for the twelve began with the sun setting over the hills in front of them. It was calm, but that could change very suddenly on the Sea of Galilee when the wind sweeps down the hills that surround it and cause a gale. That happened. And somewhere out in the middle of the sea, Matthew says, a long distance from the land, the boat was being battered by wind and waves. Evidently the boat had been driven off course and out into the middle of the sea where they were frantically fighting the elements for hours but getting nowhere, only further off course. It was now early in the morning. They were fatigued and frightened as you can imagine anyone would be, but these were men who were seasoned fishermen. They lived on the sea. They understood the dangers that they were facing and what could occur. So they were struggling. Struggling at their oars, struggling against the wind and the waves. They had been in a situation like this before. You'll remember back in chapter 4. They were out on the sea. It was night. A gale was Raging, In fact, it threatened to sink the boat they were in. And Jesus, who was with them, was asleep. And so they woke him in desperation, thinking that he didn't care. And he stood, and he spoke to the wind and the waves, and he calmed the sea immediately. Well, he wasn't with them here. They were alone. And yet they weren't. Mark gives a, a panorama, a, a, a wide vista of what was taking place here in verse 47. It was evening, it was dark, and Mark writes, the boat was in the middle of the sea and he was alone on the land. He was on the mountain praying. And he was praying for his disciples below. In fact, in verse 48, Mark writes that he saw them straining at the oars. He was out of their sight, maybe out of their minds. They were focusing completely on the crisis at hand, at the wind and the waves, and trying to get on course and trying to stay afloat. But they were not out of his sight and certainly not out of his mind. He had sent them out on the sea and he was praying for them all during their ordeal. What a picture that gives us of the Christian life. The day may begin peacefully enough with the sun in our face and a breeze at our back and then suddenly it turns ugly. Suddenly we get blindsided. But he is right where he is supposed to be. He is on his throne and ruling. Christ is always watching over us. He is our great high priest, seated in power in heaven. He sees everything and he is always praying for us. That is the reality that this scene gives. It's a magnificent scene. In fact, I think it's one worthy of a masterpiece by a, a Rembrandt or a Turner. The, the small boat out there in the stormy sea and above Jesus on the mountain watching and praying. The two together. That's the picture that Mark gives here. And that's the spiritual reality now, presently. We feel alone perhaps, but we never are. 
The Lord is always seeing us in the situations of life that we are in, always straining at the oars, as you, as you might have it from this, from this passage. We are always in these kind of difficulties, challenges of one kind or another. And he sees, and he knows, and he is constantly praying for us and applying to us his grace and applying it to us effectively. Some significant action in the Bible happens on the sea. A number of passages like that. Acts 27 comes to mind. You will come to that passage eventually in Mark's studies in the book of Acts. It's a magnificent uh, passage really. I think very practical passage for us. Paul was on the sea. He was in the storm and uh, this ship with all of its people Prisoners, soldiers, crewmen were out on the Mediterranean in a storm for two weeks. Two weeks in a storm. The ship was tossed around and the, and the crew was helpless. They did everything they could to keep the ship afloat. But it, it, it was a lost cause and they realized that. But at that moment, at that time, Paul was given a message. And the message was don't abandoned ship. Stay on board and not a soul will be lost. And so Paul told everyone to take courage, he said. He did. And the reason he was able to take courage was simple. He said, for I believe God that it will turn out exactly as I have been told. And it did. Uh, ship was wrecked on the rocks of Malta, but all 276 persons, it's a lot of people, all of them stayed on board and all of them were saved. They came through the storm just as the Lord had promised. Sometimes all we can do in the trials of life is hold on. Sometimes all we can do is just stay on board, stay faithful, pray and wait on the Lord. And He will prove faithful. His Word won't fail. His promises are yes and amen. They're steadfast and He is steadfast. Now that is faith. That's faith in the Word of God. It's not blind faith. It's faith in the one who is sufficient for every need and circumstance and who will never fail us. The disciples stayed at the oars and they were able to do that because Christ was watching them and praying for them, giving them the strength to persevere and keeping the boat afloat. His prayers are effective. And that's what He does for us. We don't see him doing it. He's, he's in the mountain of God, but he sees us always. And at the right time, he gives relief and deliverance. He is an on time God. Every year I go to the Sovereign Grace Conference here in Dallas, which is sponsored by a friend of mine, Greg Wren. And it's largely African American ministers who preach and teach for a week. Uh, last year I was there and was visiting with some of the men and one of them commented on a sermon that had been preached and he said, he's an on time God. And I thought, well, that's a good expression. I like that. And they explained that it's a gospel song that's well known in the black churches. And so I looked it up and it has a good refrain. He's an on-time God. Yes, He is. He may not come when you want Him, but He'll be there right on time. Well, that's true. That's very well put. And we see that here. That's what He does for us. At the right time, at about the fourth watch of the night, Mark says, which is around four or five in the morning, when it was still dark and misty, Jesus came to them walking on the sea. He made a path through the sea to deliver them from danger. It was a moment of relief, but also a moment of revelation. 
Job chapter 9 verse 8 says that God alone stretches out the heavens and treads upon the sea. And here he comes, treading upon the sea. That is, is first and foremost what all of this is about. Jesus is God. He is the second person of the Trinity. He is God the Son. He can suspend the laws of nature to do His will. He can tread upon the sea. The elements are subject to Him. The psalmist said, He brings forth the wind from His treasuries. Paul told the Colossians, In Him all things hold together. That's all things. The, the boat the disciples were in and the sea that they were on. Everything. The vast universe holds together in Him, in Jesus Christ, and by Him at His command. The one who prayed on the mountain. And He came to them in their hour of need, in that power and glory, right on time. But Mark writes, he intended to pass by them. Now, why is that? You read that and it seems curious. He's coming to them. They're in great need and he was going to walk by them. Well, not of course to continue on and leave them behind, but to reveal himself to them. This was part of the theophany that, that they were observing. The, the manifestation of God the manifestation of His glory and greatness and His nature. That's a theophany and that's what they were given. And there's some history to that, this intending to pass by. It's what He did on Mount Sinai when He passed by Moses, whom He had placed in the cleft of the rock, and He revealed Himself, who He is. And Moses got a glimpse of his glory. And when he passed by Elijah on Mount Horeb in a gentle wind, he always passed by his servants to encourage them and to strengthen them. But as he, he came to the disciples, out of the dark and the mist and the, the driving wind, they were mystified by what they were seeing. They were terrified by it. They thought he was a ghost, literally a phantasm. Now that doesn't mean they believed in ghosts and that they were superstitious men and that this, this was something that uh, was a kind of common experience for them seeing ghosts and things like that. Not at all. This was unusual. How else could they explain the, 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 the phenomenon they were witnessing? And I think the fact that they they saw, they thought they saw a ghost, really gives a realistic feel to the moment. That's the only way at the moment they could explain what they, they were seeing. They'd never seen a sight such as this. It was unique. It was supernatural. So naturally, when they looked up from their oars and into the dark void and they saw him, it was a mystery to them. How do you explain this? I doubt that a, a crew or passengers today out on the Atlantic in a storm at midnight would have responded much differently if they saw someone walking across the waves toward them. Still there was some, there's, there is nothing, there was nothing ghostly about Jesus. And the, and the fact that they could see God and think that while they're seeing him, they're seeing a ghost really reveals a lot about their knowledge and faith. And that is that they were still learning a lot about Christ. And maybe it shows that oftentimes things that frighten us shouldn't. They're blessings when we think that they are not. This was a, a, an unrecognized blessing coming to them in their distress. That's what Jesus tells them. At this glorious moment that terrified them, He spoke these great words that we read all through the Bible. Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Now, 
We can say that, and, and we do. Take courage, don't be afraid, don't worry, everything will work out. It always does. And, and, and oftentimes we'll be right when we say that because things do work out. But we don't really know that, and we certainly don't have the power to, to make them work out. We don't have control over the circumstances. So we really have no authority when we make such a statement even though we're trying to encourage and, and, and help. But Jesus does have the authority. Jesus does have the power. His words were genuine. He said, take courage, it is I. Take courage because I am here. And when I am here with you, you have nothing to fear. I am the I am. That's what he's saying. In saying, it is I, he was speaking the divine name, God's personal name, Jehovah or Yahweh, which means I am. That, that's the literal translation of Mark's quote here. So the Lord was revealing in, in both his actions and words that he is Jehovah, that he is the Lord God. Now, as I said, that's the reason for all of this. That's really the basic revelation and the basic lesson of this incident, this whole event, is that He is the I Am, that He is the Lord God. But there's great encouragement here in, as well. This is also the lesson. This is great encouragement. God was with them even in the storm, and they were secure, therefore. Some hymn writers are off a bit. Now, the hymns we've sung today are excellent hymns. They don't, those, those hymn writers will not be saved so as by fire. They were excellent hymns and excellent hymn writers. And another of the great hymn writers, uh, one of my favorite, is William Cooper. And one of those hymns, a hymn we really don't sing very much, maybe in the evening meeting, it's a simple hymn, but a very profound hymn. God moves in a mysterious way. It's based on this incident. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. And so Cooper counsels through his hymn, Courage and faith. Trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence he hides his smiling face. Now for eight hours Jesus watched and prayed as his dearest friends, his disciples, strained at the oars. He let it go on and on. Why so long? I don't doubt that the Lord in his human nature felt deeply for his close friends, those 12 men out on the sea and in, in danger, in genuine danger. And he, he prayed for them with earnestness as they went through that great ordeal. And you wonder, well, why so long? And the only answer I could give, and I think the right answer is, because in his wisdom, he knew they needed that. He knew they needed every moment of that storm and every moment of that struggle, every, every pull on the oar was necessary for them. Paul said, tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character hope, and hope does not disappoint. This is how we grow. We grow through the study of God's Word, we go through the experiences of life, and as we apply the Word of God to those experiences, this is what God produces in us, perseverance, proven character, and hope. This is how hope becomes a reality within us. And the greater the trial, the greater the deliverance, and the more clearly we see the Lord's hand in all of it. And through it all, we learn about Him. And because we learn about Him, we're able to trust Him more completely the next time we have difficulties, or even in the, just the routine of life. We're able to trust Him for His grace. And we learn that His grace is always sufficient. Something we need to learn. Robert Murray McShane is one of my favorite people. A Scottish minister in the early 1800s. He died at the age of 29. 
But he had a great ministry, short though it was. Had a very interesting life, short though it was. In 1839 he went to Palestine with some others from the Church of Scotland to investigate the possibility of a mission to the Jews. And they wanted to really galvanize that interest in, the, in, in Jewish evangelism was they were premillennialists. Uh, McShane and the Bonar brothers and others and they knew from Romans 11 that the Gentile is to provoke the Jew to jealousy and they knew that through that the kingdom would come and so they were looking at this mission in that light. And while he was away his thoughts were always back on the church in Dundee, Scotland. On one occasion he sent a letter to a fellow minister giving encouragement about uh, carrying on the ministry and, and, and then he wrote in this letter about his concern for the, the people back in Scotland especially in his church in Dundee. He said, prepare them for sore trials. I fear most Christians are quite unready for days of darkness. Now that was over 150 years ago to a people and generation that were probably a lot tougher than we are, who'd gone through more difficulties than we have gone through. And I wonder how ready we are for days of darkness. The only way to prepare for those hard times to come is by knowing <clears throat> that they will come. And by knowing the one who can give hope in the storm and encouragement that is real. The world has other ways during the Great Depression when, <clears throat> when millions were out of work and unable to get work. One way that they dealt with those difficulties with hardship was entertainment. As early as 8 a.m., New Yorkers would line up at Times Square and 42nd Street to take refuge in movie theaters showing three features. And for 15 cents, they could go to the movies and they could forget their troubles. <clears throat> and lots of them did that. That's the way the world seeks help in anodynes, in in ways to, to dull the mind, to numb the pain and forget one's worries and heartaches. And I suppose that works for a little while, but that, that, that doesn't change things. It doesn't make the troubles go away. The way of the Christian is not escape, but knowledge. Knowledge of the Lord. Personal knowledge and factual knowledge. That's the only way to prepare for the dark valleys to come. And that comes only through faith in God's Word. That's how we get to know Christ. We need to study God's Word. I think maybe that gets uh, emphasized a lot from this pulpit, but rightly so, because that is what we need. That's where we learn of our Lord's character. That's where we learn of His power, His promises, and faithfulness. And as we learn that, then we learn it in another way through experience. We find Him to be faithful. We put ourselves in the care of and under the control of the One who rules nature and governs every circumstance who plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm, even a hurricane. When the disciples heard him, they understood what they were seeing, they believed, and they rejoiced. We trust our eyes, but sight deceives. The things we see deceive. We're not to live by sight. We're to live by faith. And it's God's Word that enlightens. Christ speaks and then they understand. 
I think that's an illustration of what Paul writes in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Faith comes from hearing. Which is the way of saying it is by hearing the Word of God, it's by reading it, it's by knowing it that our faith grows and we understand. Now Matthew tells us this was when Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water, at least walked for a little while. He doesn't, Mark doesn't recount that here. It, it, the, his gospel, as we pointed out from the beginning, moves quickly. It was designed to, to move in a rapid rate, or at a rapid pace. And so what he writes is, Jesus got into the boat with them, the wind stopped, and they were utterly astonished. Kind of a staccato, quick pace to what he says. Now that was actually a second miracle because John wrote that immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. So no wonder they were utterly astonished. Now they understood the reason for what they had gone through. At least they understood in part. The reason that they were so alarmed moments earlier and thought that they were seeing a ghost is given in verse 52. It really is a commentary on them and all that has taken place. For they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves. But their heart was hardened. They had not understood the significance of that miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 plus. Charles Cranfield wrote that it was only a marvel to them, not a sign. It, is, it, it was a wonderful thing they saw, but they didn't get revelation from it. They didn't see the significance of it, the sign that was communicated through it. They got no revelation from what had taken place. They didn't connect the miracle in Jesus back to Israel's early years in the wilderness when God fed the nation with bread from heaven for 40 years. That He is the same Lord who prepared a table in the wilderness. They didn't make that connection. They gained nothing from that miracle. So they were unprepared for the crisis on the sea. They should have been prepared for it. But they weren't. And so they were unable to understand the Lord's appearance on the water. Their heart was hardened. Now that explains the failure of modern scholars to understand or believe this event as well. Mark's account has been explained as an embellishment or exaggeration of what actually happened. And what they say actually occurred was an event much closer to the shore. The reality was Jesus was simply wading through the shallows near the land, but the disciples couldn't see that through the darkness and mistook Him to be walking on the water. Well, there's nothing in the text to support that. And if that had been the case, they would have learned of their mistake, and Mark would have never recorded this in his gospel. But the problem is really deeper. Uh, the, it's a failure to understand the previous event, the incident of the loaves. If a person doesn't understand that a miracle occurred there, then he won't understand that a miracle occurred here. But really, it goes back even further in the book. It goes back to the very first verse of the Gospel of Mark, where Mark made clear what he was writing about. It is the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And all of this is given in support of that. All of the miracles that he's performed are given in support of that. The the lame man who was healed and whose sins were forgiven and that upset the Pharisees and scribes so much. The raising of Jairus' daughter, the healing of the woman with the issue of blood, the feeding of the 5,000, the walking on water. All of that really is, is given in support of what the Lord, of that statement that Jesus is the Son of God. If a person 
can only see the miracles as embellishments or exaggeration of purely naturalistic events, then, then the issue is a, is a spiritual one. The issue is a lack of understanding, a lack of enlightenment, a lack of faith on their part. There should be no question that these events such as feeding 5,000 people plus or walking on the water are possible for the Son of God. If we understand it's the Son of God that's described here, that's no great challenge for Him to do these things. That's the point. The problem is with the person who's interpreting the Scriptures. If we don't begin with faith, if we don't begin with the knowledge and conviction that this is the Son of God that is described here, and God is like this, then we won't understand anything. So, the problem is with the interpreter's heart. It's hardened. And so they don't understand. Well, that was the disciples' problem, Mark says. Like so many of us, they were slow learners. But the Lord didn't give up on them. He was patient and continued teaching them. The chapter ends with that, the chapter ends with more miracles. They arrive safely on the other shore in Gennesaret on the western shore of the sea, just south of Capernaum. And when they got out of the boat, the people there recognized Jesus immediately. They ran to Him from the whole country, bringing their sick to Him. And every village He entered, the people begged Him to heal them. Others just touched the the fringe of his cloak. Maybe they had heard about that woman with the issue of blood and what she had done, and they thought, if we can just touch the fringe of his cloak too, we'll be cured. And so they seized the opportunity while it was there, getting healing for themselves and their friends. That was wise, it was wisdom as far as it went. The problem is, as we learn later, it didn't go far enough. But that was wise what they did. They got healing from Him. They took advantage of that opportunity. And what all of this demonstrates is whether feeding a multitude of hungry people or making a path through the sea to deliver disciples in distress or healing the sick, Christ is the Son of God. So He is the source of blessing and we can trust Him to give help in time of need. When He says to His disciples, not just the twelve, but all of His disciples, His people, His church, down through the ages, take courage, we can do that. We can rest in that. Those words ring throughout the Word of God. The Lord spoke them to Joshua at the beginning of his ministry. Moses had died, and Joshua was the newly established leader of Israel. And that would have been a daunting challenge for anyone. And he had been prepared for that, but nevertheless it was, uh, it was an overwhelming challenge to lead that people. And so the Lord spoke to him early on in Joshua uh, chapter 1 and verse 6, at the very beginning, he said, Be strong and courageous. Later, when he faced a great battle with the Canaanite armies, the Lord told him, Do not be afraid. When Gentile armies of the Assyrians, Sennacherib's armies, surrounded Jerusalem and threatened to destroy it, and threatened them with, with uh, pretty scary challenges. And uh, God spoke to King Hezekiah and said, Do not be afraid. And he delivered the city. When Paul was in Corinth, experiencing hostility, the Lord spoke to him in a vision and said, Do not be afraid and do not be silent. And he gave Paul great success in that city. There are many examples of the Lord speaking to His people when they face daunting challenges or life-threatening situations with the words, take courage. Those aren't empty words. 
Those are words we can rely on. I say we can rely on them. How can we rely on them with much confidence when the Lord isn't here with us? If he, if he appeared to us, we would think, well, there he is. I can rest in what he says. But how do we do it when we just read about it? And we're, what's, what's real to us is the crisis that we're in. Well, it's true the Lord's not with us bodily in that sense, but then he wasn't with the disciples either in that boat rowing against the wind. He was on the mountain praying. And, and that is where he is now, doing the same for us. He is up on high on the throne of God, praying for us as our great high priest. He sees us down below here, straining at the oars. He knows our circumstances. He knows our weaknesses. He is patient with us and he is constantly praying for us, praying for you individually. And his prayers are effective. They obtain what he seeks. They give us strength and courage. It is supernatural. You cannot explain the Christian life in any other way than supernatural. That Christ is alive in heaven above and the Holy Spirit is here in our hearts on the earth and they are both praying for us. The Godhead is praying for us. And the Father's receiving their prayers and answering them. They are giving us understanding and faith. They are strengthening our faith so that we can take courage and not be afraid and so that we can encourage others in that way. That's what we're to be doing. The author of Hebrews instructs us to do that. Strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble. I think he means you yourself strengthen your own hands and your own feeble knees and do that through God's Word and do that through prayer, but also do that for one another. The Christian life is lived in the storm so often and we need encouragement from one another. We need to bear one another's burdens. But be an encouragement based on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ and His promises. That's what Hugh Latimer did for Nicholas Ridley on October 16, 1555 when they were led through the streets of Oxford to their fiery death for doing what? What was their crime? Preaching the gospel. And just before the fire was lit, old Latimer cried out to his young friend, be of good comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man. And they both did. And as Latimer predicted, lit a candle in England that day. Now that kind of, of courage comes from the Lord and the confidence that He is the Son of God, the I Am, the one who plants His footsteps in the sea. And that He's with us, always with us, always faithful. If you are a Christian, you have every reason to take courage and be not afraid. If you're not, if you've not put your faith in Christ, you have every reason to be terrified. Because a storm far greater than what those disciples were in on that sea or what's threatening our own coast is coming. So it is urgent. Run to Christ while you have opportunity like those did who came to him for healing. He receives all who do, and he heals them spiritually. He gives forgiveness to everyone who approaches him in faith and trusts in him. And let us remember what the hymn writer said When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. Whatever touches your life as a believer in Jesus Christ is for your good.
and comes to you from the good hand of an all-wise God. Now, we know that by faith. May God give us the strength to rest in that and respond well to it. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the great truths that are revealed here about your Son and about life and the difficulties of it. They can't overwhelm us. They are more than we can handle. I guess it's easy to speak glibly about some of these things when the sun's out and we're not facing the kind of threats that other people are from the weather or the the kind of threats that the disciples went through that, that night they crossed the sea. But nevertheless, it's true, and this is what you're teaching, and we need to rest in that. And I pray that you'd strengthen our faith that we would be able to face dark days when they come, because they will come for all of us. And may we stand fast. And the only way we'll stand fast is if we know your word. So, Father, put it within our hearts to know the scriptures, to learn them, and to trust them because to trust in your word is to trust in you and that's where we have strength and stability thank you for all that you've given us in your son thank you for him and it's in his name we pray amen